Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A warm welcome to Muslima Insight. In today's topic, we are going to look at the rights and status of women in Islam and perhaps in society in general as well. And with me in studio to share with us on this very a topic that to many may sound very cliche, it's often thrown around, but yet for many it is underscored and underestimated when we think of the actual fruition and achievement of living out and giving women their rights as well as keeping their status in society. And like I said with me in studio, I've got two wonderful guests that's going to share with us their wisdom, their insight and teach us a little bit more about our Dean and how we should apply this particular topic in our lives. On my left, I've got lovely sister Fatima Domingo, who is not only a primary school teacher, she has also done Islamic studies with UNISA and has been actively involved in support groups for women for the past 15 years. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Shukran, I'm honored to be here. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran, shukran. shukran sister. And then I've got um, a very familiar face right here on ITV, um, Sheikh Abdul Samad Abdul Qadir, who presents for us the keys of the Quran on ITV as well. Assalamu alaikum and welcome, brother. Wa alaikum salam to you, Sister Adila, and also assalamu alaikum to all our viewers out there. Ji, and, alhamdulillah. Uh, shukran for inviting me as a guest. Alhamdulillah, I'm very, very honored to have both of you here. Um, to start off this very sensitive topic, um, like I said, that's very much underscored and not always achieved in our societies, is can we perhaps think about what do we mean when we say the words, the rights of women? Can any of, of you explain to me what, what does it do to you? What does it say to, to society um, in general, the status of women? Okay, for me, what I feel the status of women is that the Creator has chosen a woman's womb in which to carry His creation. And therefore, He has elevated her status. And if you look through the history of mankind, you will see that women have always been the backbone of every struggle. They've always been there as a support to their, to their, the, to their, uh, to their male counterparts. And for instance, Allah has raised the status of a woman. He's even named a Quranic verse after Sitina Maryam, alayhi salam. And also millions upon millions of pilgrims run from Safa to Marwa if, um, when they go for Umrah or for Hajj in the Sunnah of Hajira, alayhi salam. And so that is how Allah has elevated our status. But we as women need to always reclaim that heritage and in, we need to always educate ourselves and to make ourselves enlightened beings because it's one thing to gain knowledge, but then you have to implement it and to claim your right because knowledge is power, but implementation is empowerment. Of and course. that to me is what, what it's all about. It's about knowledge and implementation to make us a vibrant, um, fruitful community. We have to implement that. Gee, sure. And it, it, may, it, it speaks of a lot of truth in the sense of that concept of personal responsibility. Yes. Um, like you say, to claim that right and to live up to it. Um, uh, Sheikh, if we come to, to the Quranic aspect of this topic, uh, for the sake of our non-Muslim viewers as well, can Sheikh elaborate for us, um, before the advent of Islam, how women were treated and what in fact happened that changed us so dramatically? That's a wonderful question. Actually, we can start even before a child is born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, wa izal ma'udati su'ilat bi ayyi zambin qutilat. Like a female child that was buried alive, uh, is gonna ask on the day of Qiyamah on what account was she buried. Now we find that in those days, there was no advancement in medical science. So a father had to wait for the child to be born and he was so disgusted and he decided that he rather bury the child. But today, in modern times, we find that we can practice that with, with the uh, infanticide, female abortion of fetus and things like that. But coming to the question, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the women even before she was born, number one. Mm. Then when the child was born, she had certain rights. Now, now in, in that society where women were, were looked down upon, the father was also ashamed to be the father of a female child. 
Now you find that the comparison is that when the child is born, Allah says in the, in the Quran, you must give it a good name. And Allah Nabi has said that that seeking of knowledge is compulsory on both male and female. At that time, the female was not given education. And also what happened is, as the female child became a, 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 a sort of a teenager, in that Arab society, they used to just dress in such a way that people could look at them lustfully. Mm-hmm. Quran regulated that. He says, you as a woman must dress in such and such order that people do not look at you. You see the difference what, uh, what Quran has done. Mm-hmm. And then there was what you call a lot of immorality was going on where women was, uh, could be even gambled away. My wife to your wife, you win, you take my wife as well. You see that type of a respect they had. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did also where women were exploited at the time of marriage. So Islam introduced the system of the mahar, the dowry, where in order to get married, the man has to, the husband has to come and say, lady, I want to marry you. She says, okay, what gift? Allah says in the Quran, وَآتُوا nisa sadaqatu hunna nihla, that you must give, give to women their sadaqat, meaning their dowry at the time of marriage. And look at the word, Allah used the word nahal. Mm-hmm. Now nahal, it means a bee. You give the dowry like how the bee, the honey bee gives the honey. In that way, in other words, without any prejudice, without any counting it to say, this is the point, I stop here. You see, that's why Allah uses that. Then when a person is, for instance, after you are educated in a Quranic way, and the Prophet said you must be equally educated as a male. Now, at that time, a woman could not go and demand her rights to say that I must be paid the same as my male counterpart. Right. So what happened? Allah says in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 32, that Wali Rijali Nasibu Tasabu, that for a male is a portion of what he earns, Wali Nisai, right? Nasibu Tasabna, and for a female is a portion of what she earns. You see? And then spiritually also, although they, they, they believed in all different kinds of idols, a woman was not counted as, as a male's equal. So Islam came and told them, no, right? That whoever does good, when Amila Salihan min Zakarina Unsa, whoever does good, irrespective of whether you are a male or a female, you brought the male and the female on an equal status. But not only that, there is no equality in Islam between male and female to mind. It must be shocking to you, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? I just told you, for instance, mm-hmm. paradise lies where? At the feet, the feet of a mother. So there's no equality for a father. Of course. <laughs> you see, do you see the difference there? Who pays the mahar at the time of marriage? The mm-hmm. groom. Mm-hmm. So that, that shows that the woman is given higher status and higher honor in Islam. Okay. You see, according to Makes chapter sense. 24, Surah An-Nur, verse number 4, if you slander a woman, an innocent woman, you must bring four witnesses. Okay. Right? This was where in Arab society a woman could be slandered. She had no recourse to anything. But the Quran came in okay. to say you must bring four witnesses. If you okay. cannot bring four witnesses, you are going to be given 80 lashes. Okay. Now, I find that it's not equal. The man does not have that. Mm. Then Allah says in the Quran, right at the beginning of, of uh, Surah, what you call, An-Nisa, okay. Be conscious of Allah through whom you ask your rights. And be conscious of the womb that bore you. Mm-hmm. Where Allah is given that mother, that status, that you must show taqwa, mm-hmm. which was not in that Arab society. You see, which this one raised. And then Allah emphasized the question of marriage. You can't just take a woman and say, I'm going to just live with her and then tell her goodbye. But what happened, Allah says in the Quran, even a slave girl, if you take, Allah says two conditions. Mm-hmm. Marry them with the permission of the people, where there is the master, who, for, even for a slave girl, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. cannot take her like that. And then, mm-hmm. as well as giving them the dowry, two conditions. Mm-hmm. You see, the status even for a slave girl. Mm-hmm. You see, and another thing is, see, when Allah says, that uh, chapter 4, verse 34, Allah says, Ar-rijalu qawwa munala nisa. Men are not the bosses, but the maintainers and the protectors of women. Mm-hmm. Then Allah says, Bima faddalallahu ba'dahum ala ba'd. On account of the fact 
that Allah has given one preference over the other, excellence or preference. You find that male has got certain preference and excellence over the female, and so does the female has. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. and there is not one single verse in the Quran that tells us that the women are less in status than men, except one. Okay. Chapter 2, verse 128, and Allah is talking about when a woman is divorced and she is going to go through the menstruation, and in case she give birth, and there Allah talks about one advantage the man has got. Obviously, okay. man does not menstruate, he does not fall pregnant, so that is the only, and Allah used the word daraja, meaning singular, mm -hmm. not darajat in its plural form. Mm -hmm. That is the only difference that Allah has talked. But other than that, in my research, I found out that uh, women have got a higher in so far as honor is concerned mm -hmm. and respect in Islam, the women got higher. And not only that, you find the household maintenance is a responsibility of the husband. Therefore, the woman is given half the inheritance of the male because she, when she gets an inheritance, she can do whatever she wants to, but the male cannot do that. Right. Shukran, uh, Sheikh, I really appreciate the very... Um, lovely layout from how chronologically it goes from birth all the way up yeah. um, on that note it's time for us to take a break don't go away Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A warm welcome back to Muslima Insight. Before the, th before the break, Sheikh Abdul Samad Abdul Qadir was explaining to us from a chronological perspective the rights and status of women in Islam. And very eloquently, you also brought in for us the equality that there are between men and women. Certainly. Taking it a step further back, before, um, like I said, before the advent of Islam and after the advent of Islam, if we go way back in history to the creation of Adam salam and his partner Hawa, um, English for our English viewers or um, non-Muslim viewers, of course, we're talking about Adam and Eve. Can Sheikh elaborate for us the significance of that particular couple in our lives today? See, the Quran says right at the very beginning of Surah An-Nisa, like Fatima said, that even a Surah is named An-Nisa, the women, number four. Right. Ya ayyuhan nasu. Right. Inna khalaqnakum min nafsin wahida. Allah says, we created you from a single nafs. Wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. And from that original nafs, Allah says, we created its partner, zawj. And there's no way in the Quran Allah used the word. You see, in Arabic, when you put a feminine round ta, Right, it becomes feminine, mm -hmm. you see. But zawj is used in that one masculine form. There's no such word as zawja in the whole Quran. I, I made a thorough study of that one thing, particular thing. And then when Allah says he created that, and wabasaf min huma, and from that too, Allah did create. But coming back to the story of the, uh, what you call the Garden of Eden, the so-called Jannah. Okay. You see, Allah created that partner and they were living there. Two important things we learned there. That Allah commanded, Ya Adam uskun anta wa zawju kal jannah. Oh Adam, dwell you and your, your zawj, meaning your partner, whether we call it Hawa or Eve in the, uh, in the biblical term, in that place. Mm -hmm. And then he commanded them not to do certain things. Now to show you the biblical version where they say that the devil came and the serpent and all, they tried to tempt uh, Eve and Eve did tempt Adam. Uh, Adam in return. But the Quran says very, very clearly, that is in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَأَزَلَّ huma. huma in Arabic means both of them. Mm -hmm. It's a dual. Mm -hmm. فَأَزَلَّ huma shaytanu anha. So shaitan, what is shaitan? How he came, whether you got to go to the biblical version to say he came as a serpent or whatever it is, or it was their own evil self. Mm -hmm. Right? So both of them, according to the Quran, when the Quran says فَأَزَلَّ huma, that both that uh, Satan caused both of them, right, to, to, to cause to slip. And then, فَأَزَلَّهُمَا الشَّيْطَانُ anha فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا And caused them both to be expelled. That is, Allah used the word both, dual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they doesn't use that uh, to say that it was uh, the woman that was responsible. Quran does not say that. Quran says the both are, are responsible. Right? Okay. That's one point. Secondly is, 
You see, when Shaitan, when he looked at Adam and Allah asked him, Us juduli Adam, prostrate before Adam. Mm-hmm. Right? He refused. Why did he refuse? Right. You see, because he says that Khalaktahu min tinin wa khalaktani min nad. You created him from uh, what you call dust and soil and you created me from fire. And that one sentence, ana khairu minhu that I am better than him. Oh, you see, okay. each of us, we have got that pride, pride. and arrogance. Okay. So you're talking about the history of Adam. This is exactly what, what is the story. The most important thing is here. We are very quick to, mm-hmm. to say that it was a woman. No, mm-hmm. it wasn't the woman. Quran uses that thing in a dual form for azallahuma. Both of them are responsible. Yeah, so they both w- bought into and followed the let's call it the evil of that Chaitan put in front it was a choice that they both ma- made exactly to engage in yes. um, Sister Fatima if we come back to what Jay was mentioning earlier about equality mm-hmm. um, being actively involved in women's groups what is your experience in the sense of are women treated equally when it comes to issues like divorce maintenance of children um, careers what is your experience in this field no theoretically yes we have the quran as our constitution or our manual you know like when you learn to drive a car you need to follow the manual but in in reality no that is and the problem is two-sided one is that i think both male and female don't know they don't have enough knowledge i think the, the male that treats his wife like that doesn't realize that um, you know he what he is oppressing her and of course we inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji when we are come from Allah and we return to him so the male must be careful because we're not only living for this life but for the eternal life as well so he needs to make sure that her rights are accorded mm-hmm. that the woman's uh, her but her God-given rights mm-hmm. or Allah-given rights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem is with women also is that they are too docile, they are too blasé. Mm-hmm. They don't take control of their own knowledge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They must, what my experience is that a lot of women are still ignorant as mm-hmm. to what is what are their rights are and they have to go out and learn. Mm-hmm. They must do that and they must hold their partner accountable. Mm-hmm. They must say, look, I need you to maintain me in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I, I would like to stress to women out there, please, even if you're married, go into a contract. Even if you didn't do a contract prior to your marriage, you can still do it now while you are married so mm-hmm. that you can if there is a dissolution of the marriage you can say who's going to have custody mm-hmm. um, and of the children who's going to maintain the children all mm-hmm. of those things need to be in place Absolutely. you have to and I think a contract is very very important a marital contract even if you're married already Gee. Yes. W- would you say um, and have you come across um, of course from an Islamic perspective uh, the women have certain duties and responsibilities when it comes to the raising of the children mm. um, and yet in my personal experience I find that a lot of women Um, although they live up to that, they mm-hmm. sort of cut themselves off from the world out there and they stop being empowered. They stop Absolutely. being alive. Yes. And which causes then a lot of friction within the marriage. Is that what you find as well? Yes. I think it's to do with self-esteem and belief in themselves. They don't believe that. You see, it's also society. Okay. Because we are microcosm of this macrocosm. Okay. The thing is society... Um, devalues the the role of uh, a housewife. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you are at home, you are seen as backward and ignorant. Mm-hmm. But women that are at home and are not going out to uh, contribute economically can do other things to empower themselves. Mm-hmm. There's many, many ways to do it. So you also, as a woman, need to examine yourself, do some self-reflection, think about how is your role in your partner's life, how important you are. Because The, the primary role of a, of a mother is with her children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So because the society has also become very materialistic, consumerist. So a lot of women are going out there and going to earn a living mm-hmm. and then forsaking the children mm-hmm. for that. And you have to, you know, it's, it's just a balancing act all the time. Mm-hmm. I think women who do choose to be housewives can also make sure that they go out there, educate themselves mm-hmm. and then enlighten their children mm-hmm. because they are the primary educators. Like they say, 
if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. A nation. And that is so important. And that is a very important role. It's mm -hmm. not a role that should be devalued. Yes. A woman is the primary educator of her children. Mm -hmm. She's the one who's going to make them enlightened beings. Mm -hmm. They will be the mirror of her one day. Mm -hmm. So she has to be educated. Gee, gee. And obviously when she is educated, um, it keeps the, the flame alive between the male and the female, the, the husband and the wife. Because sure. um, if the man then excels, develops in career, etc., and the wife doesn't, it can lead to problems. Okay. It can, because then ideologically and in every other way, they haven't got a lot in common. Mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm. to try and evolve together in that way. Mm -hmm, Say, mm -hmm. for instance, there's tafsir classes you can go to mm -hmm. so that you can empower yourself through knowledge as a woman. You go together as partners, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. discuss what you have learned, make yourself, make your, your household a vibrant a household Gee. with education. You know, uh, that is very, very important. Make your household a place of learning. And, and where you, you and your husband, again, can share a, a, a commonality mm. because he might be in a total different career and you are at home raising children. Yes. But something like that brings you back together That's again. Right. Um, Sheikh, when we look at, at the Holy Quran, can Sheikh please elaborate for us when it comes to something as simple as the keeping of friends. Certain times women may have friends that influences them in a wrong way, or the male. Uh, what does the Quran say pertaining to this? You see, what is also very important, like we, she spoke at the beginning about the rights of a woman, Gee. rights of the wife. She has got rights, but uh, you see they have to live together as husband and wife. Gee. Let's look at the practical part of it. Gee. Now, if you feel that, uh, that you have a friend and that can cause a little friction in your marriage, mm -hmm. then what happens is that it is rather you should do things, both parties, not only the husband, the wife also, should also accommodate certain things with the husband that you do not create a friction in the family. Mm -hmm. And even if the, the wife tells the husband, I do not want so and so as your friend, mm -hmm. he must also comply. The thing is, the most important thing is to see the marriage must be successful. Mm -hmm. So friends can come in, but mm -hmm. if that causes a friction, I myself, I would say that I would tell that friend of mine, please keep off my wife. I mean, it's causing problem in my house. I think that is the right way to go. And I absolutely can agree with that because your marriage is primary. Yes. It, it completes half of your religion. Yes. And friends, friendship with friends is obviously secondary. Yes. Mm -hmm. On that note, it's time for us to once again take a break. Don't go away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A warm welcome back to Muslima Insight. In today's topic, we are looking at the rights and the status of women in Islam and society in general. Um, I would like to ask um, a topic that has become very prevalent, and even perhaps we can use the fact that it has become very rife in Muslim societies as well as non-Muslim societies, is the fact that people go out and have extramarital affairs. Now, of course, today's topic, we're talking about the rights and status of women, yes. and there's no bias meant against the men, sure. because women also go out yes. and, and have extramarital affairs. Yes. But let us take it for the sake of today's topic, mm. from a female perspective, being in a marriage um, where a man goes out and commits zina, yes. um, and he has an adulterous affair, what does the Quran say to us? Um, what is the severity of this particular deed and it being regarded as a major sin? You see, the Quran uses this one phrase, muhsinina ghaira musafihin. It means you have a relationship with the opposite sex, both ways, for male and a female, okay. with honest wedlock. That is the translation of the first word. Ghaira musafihin, not in illicit sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the Quran forbids that type of a thing immediately. Mm -hmm. And then you see, Allah's Nabi Sallallahu has said that a marriage must be announced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, now adultery, you don't go and announce, you keep a secret, uh, what you call uh, affair. Of course. Now it is, in fact, it is harmful to both because Allah says, La taqrabu zina innahu kana fahishatan wa sa'a sabila. That do not create conditions. Mm -hmm. People who translate, they say, don't go near zina. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it means two people are committing zina. That's not a literal translation. Mm -hmm. It means do not create conditions, do not approach those conditions of zina. Why Allah give to? First he says, right, inna hukana sa, right, la taqrabu zina, inna hukana fahishatan wa sa, it's a fahisha, it is an indecency, it is an immoral act. Mm -hmm. And then wa sa asabila, it's evil as a way. Mm -hmm. Why, why, why Allah calls it those two things? Because it disrupts society, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it creates, uh, I'm not looking from the point of view of the disease and, uh, you know, a sexually uh, transported mm -hmm. diseases. True. You find socially, it, it, it actually corrupts society. It creates that enmity, mm -hmm. a sourness among people. You might have illegal children, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that children what also has no record as who's who, who's the father, etc. Mm -hmm. And then the worst part of it is the poor woman that becomes a victim in this adultery because she, the man can just leave him alone with a few children, leave her alone with a few children and run away. She's got no recourse to any justice or anything, you see. Mm -hmm. So there are so many evils of it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be breeding children who come up without knowing who the father is. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very, very sure that you have to get married, make nikah, it has to be announced. And as I said, you have to be in honest red look. That is the Islamic way. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, Shaykh, um, for the sake of our viewers that are not Muslim, what is the, the punishment, um, the way it is described in the Quran, when a person goes and commits zina? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, he says, Azania to Azani, Fadli do Kulla Wahidum Miata Jilt. Now, this is one thing I want you to know, Sister Adila, okay. that this verse starts with the adulteress and the adulterer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't start everywhere in the mm -hmm. Quran. Allah talks the male and the female, the male and the female. But this is one place in the entire Quran mm -hmm. where Allah points out Azania to Azani, the ad adulteress and the adulterer, mm -hmm. and, and then lash each one of them a hundred lashes. Mm -hmm. Now you find that, that, of course, we know in Islam we say you mustn't hit in such a way to injure people, mm -hmm. to hurt or anything like that. The idea is, in that the thing is when two people are guilty of it, then you must do it in public, Quran says. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it is more when you are guilty of this thing, you, are do, you do certain things, you call out, and it could be even televised okay. in the modern times. Mm -hmm. This punishment, somebody has been given 100 lashes mm -hmm. for this thing. And then what happened? The, the, the disgrace part of it, mm -hmm. that is more important than the real physical hurt. Hurt, of course. So in Islam, it's actually 100 lashes. Gee. So and, so in other words, it's that humiliation to go and humiliate them publicly. Exactly. Um, and and that, is, that is really, really very big. Mm -hmm. Sister, in, in your experience, what have you seen um, working with women? What is the effect? Che has mentioned it's got grave effects on the society. Mm. Um, what happens to the wife the, 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 that is, that is in, the, in the marriage when she comes to find out her long-standing husband is now having an affair? What happens to her psychologically, emotionally? Oh, yes, she goes through a lot of self-doubt. A lot of women actually blame themselves for the affair, which is wrong. You shouldn't, a lot, I know of several women that have said, maybe I'm at fault. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the problem with women. They always take things and internalize it. Mm -hmm. But yes, it destroys her psyche, her self-esteem. And she has to now then deal with daily things. She has to make sure she cooks still, she sends the children off to school. But psychologically, she has to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then, all of that will also fall onto the children. So mm -hmm. look at the ripple effect that type, that heinous act has. Mm -hmm. And of course the husband, I wouldn't say only men do it, mm -hmm. but if he perpetrates this act, he needs to know that he's, own, he's harming his own soul mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's harming his wife and the family unit. Mm -hmm. And I've seen many women so distraught. They have to go for counseling. Mm -hmm. They have to then start believing in themselves again. Mm -hmm. They have to dust themselves up and then walk with dignity because mm -hmm. that is what it does to a woman. It takes mm -hmm. her dignity and her honor away. Mm -hmm. it, it really robs her of that. And the, the person who's perpetrating the act must realize that they're harming themselves as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. not only their loved ones. Absolutely. And, and in, in society in general, um, 
what are we, wh how can we say, or how can we express the effect of this when we look at the Ummah at large or the society at large? I mean, um, those children are obviously now being raised by a mother that is psychologically unbalanced. Mm -hmm. She's hurt. She has to cope with these things. Mm -hmm. What happens to those children, which is our future re leaders? Mm -hmm. um, can we as, as Muslims safely say um, we're raising our kids perfectly all these things on the outer, but yet behind closed doors, we've got all this happening. What are some of the effects that we can see in society when we look at our children? Now, I am a school teacher. I've seen the effects it has. Some children even come and tell me, um, you know, and, and they have to still function. Sure. They still have to come to school. And, you know, children own that negativity. Mm -hmm. They start mm -hmm. blaming themselves as well. And then uh, they have to grow up with that. Um, psychologically mm -hmm. and also it, it may affect their relationships as well mm -hmm. when they grow up so we must also see as a society we need to examine adultery and see are we too blasé about it mm. are we mm. too permissible mm -hmm. because the thing is it does destroy lives Absolutely. that act des destroys lives and the person who's perpetrating needs sometimes they also need counseling because mm -hmm they are not living according to what Allah wants us to live like. Mm -hmm. And and we I think we tend to forget that we 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 lose our goal in life, that we are living for the eternal life. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. those type of things destroy societies. And sometimes even belief systems. Mm -hmm. Like for instance if a man gets married to a woman, she came into the Dean, I've no of, of I'm not gonna mention names, and she has now gone out of the fold of Islam mm -hmm. because of her experience. So that is how it destroys lives. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. children are confused because they don't know now um, which, uh, which religion to follow because they now with the father and with the mother and it has destroyed a family. Both lives. The you... building blocks of society. The building blocks of society. Our families. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And, and Sheikh, if we, if we look at um, I have had various cases in my private practice where um, men who go off, they commit the zina, they have the, the extramarital affair, and they run off and they marry this woman, either behind his first wife's back, or um, it is forced upon the first wife, she needs to accept it. Is a marriage like that valid if the zina and the adultery was committed beforehand? Well, I want to just draw a little background to it, to what Fatima has said. Of course. You see, culture has got a lot to do with this business of uh, men having affairs. Okay. You see, many a time, it depends where you are living. If you are living in certain parts of the East, where you come from a home, where the uncle had a second wife, the father had a second wife, the brother has got a second wife, and uh, it is accepted in society. Okay. Right now, we in South Africa, right, had we come here without the whites okay. and had the Zumas been around, <laughs> so taking a second wife wouldn't have been a problem with us because we came into a culture, we came into a black culture where okay. you find that it was something that local people had second wives. And psychologically, the women are conditioned, the children are exactly. conditioned. It's part of society. Yeah. Mm. So now okay. because of the mental attitude of people, this is a background to the whole thing. Now why has that person having an affair? Why didn't he make nikah at the beginning? Yeah. Because he was scared. Yeah. You understand? He was scared. He thought he would hide and do certain things. Mm -hmm. So therefore he carried on in this illegal relationship. And from the outset, mm. it is something that he shouldn't have engaged exactly. with in the first place. But because of his society, because people are going to look at him and he's going to create a situation where he's going to be stigmatized, his wife is going to, and the children also, he rather, let me carry on secretly, mm -hmm. you see. And that's exactly what people do. But had he been inside. living in a place like Pakistan or Afghanistan, he wouldn't have had that affair. He would say, okay, okay. I'm in love with her, I'll make nikah. Yes. You see, so this is a background to that. Mm. But coming to that point... Gee, right. Unfortunately, it is time for us to take a short break. And Sheikh, you must uh, elaborate further for us on this oh, point. Okay. Stay yeah. with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A warm welcome back to Muslima Insight. Before the break, Sheikh Abdul Samad Abdul Qadir was explaining to us how the act or the deed of zina 
of um, adulterous affairs have an effect on us, especially if it is not part of our psychological conditioning, the cultural background. And Sheikh, I unfortunately had to interrupt you. What was the next point that you were making? Well, actually, you see, you want to know whether what is a position of that person. Okay. You see, Allah talks in the Quran, if you look at Surah al maidah chapter 5, verse 39, that, uh, وَمَنْ تَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِ ظُلْمِ Whosoever makes Toba, and Toba doesn't mean to say Toba, 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 no. Mm -hmm. It means you turn direction from your evil way to the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Wa aslaha, and mends his way, two conditions. Mm -hmm. You turn direction and you mend your way. Mm -hmm. Right? Fa inna Allah ya tubu. So Allah also turned to him, mm -hmm. you see, mm -hmm. in mercy. So the point is, if a person is guilty of adultery, mm -hmm. right? So the best thing for him is that he must turn direction, he must change from that evil path, come to the straight path. And the second thing is he must mend the thing. In Surah An-Nisa, yeah. chapter 4, verse 128 and 129, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that I have told you, you must not be if you cannot have justice. And I challenge you, Allah says there, mm -hmm. that you won't be, I'm sure you're familiar with that verse, that you would not be just. Mm -hmm. But what I what is required by Allah that you do not favor one Above, yeah. against the other. That is what Allah talks about the second wife mm -hmm. or the, well, having more than wife. Not justice, mm -hmm. the rather injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Allah rather emphasizes that you must not be unjust. unjust. You cannot do the same thing for both wives. Mm -hmm. One wife might have five children, the other one might have one. Mm -hmm. That is not that you do not favor one against the other. This is what is required. Okay. But in a case where a person has been long with a mistress or something like that, but will society accept it? This is a thing. And you spoke about the rights of the mistress. The representative What about of... the rights of the first wife and her children? Exactly. Hey, does she have the... Now, the zina has been committed. They're yeah. not married. Does the first wife have the right to say she wants a talaq? She's, because like we said, culturally, psychologically, she's not conditioned no. to, to still feel herself full of self-esteem, good mm -hmm. about herself. Because in the first place, like Sister Fatima said, it breaks down the psyche, the yes. uh, self-concept, the self-esteem. She looks at herself, what have I done wrong? Am I not good enough? Mm -hmm. So all that self-doubt and the breakdown of her complete self-concept happens. Um, for many women, the, to end such a marriage is the only option because how can a person feel the same, be the same with your spouse knowing he has done this deed behind your back? Does she have a recourse to say, well, I the draw point the line? She line can here. use that uh, uh, as a legitimate reason to break up a family, to, to, to take that. Mm -hmm. But the point is, as I said, the economic I want to side. come in there. Okay. She is not the one breaking up the family. No, I know. It has already sorry, started sorry, sorry. on the Zina. Sorry. What I mean, <laughs> she, if she demands that she want to break up her relationship with the first husband, she's got the right to do so. What have you come across in the economic sense um, where a man takes a second wife? What many times happens in your experience from an economic perspective? Yeah, there's many, many cases. You have to look at each uh, case within the context. Okay. But I can use maybe one example where this lady was working and then the husband took a second wife and then um, he's now supporting a second household. Mm -hmm. And then she still has to work, which I feel is also unfair mm -hmm. because now she's contributing to the household and he's contributing to another household. Mm -hmm. But if, it also depends on the agreement or the contract that they have between them. Some women are very magnanimous and mm -hmm. they will accept the second wife mm -hmm. and say, okay, you know what, let's just live harmoniously. Mm -hmm. There are many, many women like that. Of course. And then there are those that choose not to love that way because mm -hmm. psychologically they haven't been socialized that way. Mm -hmm. So in, in the end, it is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the choices that you make. But yes, economically, I don't think it's fair of the husband to expect his wife to contribute so that he can have then, another wife. Yeah, so, so yeah. but then, you know, it is a personal choice. Yeah. So and obviously the, the rights again of the existing wife needs to be considered the rights of those children. Mm. See, therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, but it no, no. says that you must have a representative, not she herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She must send a representative, a smart guy, to negotiate for okay. her. And both parties must be there. Mm -hmm. Allah says, 
right? This is Hakama min ahlihi wa Hakama min ahliya. A representative mm-hmm. from his side and a representative. So here yeah, we'll have a three, three-way representative who are going to sit. So she must send somebody, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and this is how it should be done. Not just haphazardly, okay, I'm married, so I'll do this and I'll know. It mm-hmm. must be done and everything in terms of the Quran, chapter 2, verse 282, Allah says you must put it down in writing, which must be testified to with three benefits of writing. Allah mm-hmm. says, Aqsa to Indallah, mm-hmm. it is most just in the eyes of Allah. Wa shahada, it is best and strongest as evidence. Mm-hmm. These are the reasons why Allah says you must write it down, everything. Mm-hmm. And it must be fair and just. Of course. And, and obviously, just going back to that point, for, because I know for many women that I've seen in my practice and I've come across, the, um, if there is hurt involved, um, she has, like we said earlier, she has a recourse to say to here and not further, of course. Um, and, and very quickly, coming to, to the end of today's program, can Sheikh and Sister Fatima give us some closing statements um, on this particular topic? Well, uh, Fatima, is... what well, I could say is to um, both men and women out there, please go out and seek knowledge, find out what your rights are and implement it because mm-hmm. knowledge without implementation doesn't um, work. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, um, be cautious in the choices you make. Because remember, you're not only making that choice for yourself, you're making it for your family and for, you know, for society itself. Alhamdulillah. Very, very well spoken. We must not do things to hurt each other. This is True. very, very important. If you feel like, like we saw about friends, True. if your wife doesn't like you to have friends, don't hurt, don't damage your, your, your marriage. So your marriage and the children must come first. Mm. This is very, very important. Shukran Jazeelan um, for both of you being here today and adding so much wisdom and knowledge uh, to us, to the viewers. Um, from my perspective, I can, I can truly say that um, working with couples on a regular basis, the communication aspect is of vital importance um, for women to stay empowered as her husband develops, it's important for her to also still stay educated, stay involved, and most important, remember love, loving your partner is not just a word you say, but it is in fact a deed. And if we want to, like Sheikh has said, keep our marriages intact, which is half of our deen, we need to put that first before any of our lustful desires and of wrongdoing and keep our dignity intact. From myself, Adila Amod, Assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.